Section 15 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris. Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Section 15. Chapter 11. Man Proposes. Ain't it terrible a strong, healthy young fellow should go off like that? Abe Potash remarked, as he and his partner sat in their showroom one spring morning. I gave him my word I was sitting over in Hammersmith, so close to him as I am to you, Morris, when it happened. Was there much excitement? Morris asked. I bet you there was excitement, Abe exclaimed. Hammersmith sends across the street for a doctor, and you ought to see Leon Samet the way he acted. For God's sake, doctor, he says. Couldn't you do nothing for him, he says. He's got a wife and family, he says. And we shipped him two thousand dollars goods only last Saturday. Did they? Morris asked. How should I know? Abe said. Sam is such a liar, Morris. He couldn't tell the truth no matter how surprised he'd be. But one thing is sure, Morris. Gladstein did owe Samet Brothers for a big bill of goods, and the widow paid them out of the insurance. Could she do that when the fellow leaves a family, Abe? Morris inquired. The fellow didn't leave no family, Morris, Abe answered. Leon Samet just takes a chance when he said that to the doctor. As a matter of fact, Morris, Gladstein is one of them fellas, which ain't got a relation in the world. Mrs. Gladstein neither, except in Russlin. That's the way it goes, Morris. A fellow which he's got so many cousins and uncles, and he gets right as cramp already, endorsing accommodation paper for him, understand me? Lives to be an old man yet. And all the time his relations and his wife's relations is piling up on him, while a man like Gladstein, which you could really say has a chance to enjoy life, Morris, has got to die. Morris nodded. Don't I know it, he commented. And I suppose the widow sells out the store. Oh, so is Stuck, Abe said. She's still running the store, and making a fair success of it, too. Is that so? Morris replied. Well, then. Why couldn't we get some of her trade, Abe? Bridgetown ain't so far away from here. Why don't you take a run over there some time and see what you can do with her? Might you could sell her some goods, maybe? Yeah, Abe exclaimed derisively. We couldn't sell that woman goods. Not if we was to let her have them for the price of the findings, Morris. She's got an idea that she's getting stuck unless we would buy goods from the same concerns that sold Gladstein. Well, if that's the case, Abe... Morris said. She could never make so big success there. A feller like Leon Samet would just as leaf stick a widder as not. Leaf her even. Sure, I know, Abe replied. Then why don't someone give her a couple of pointers about that feller, Abe? Morris inquired. Abe nodded solemnly. You know a whole lot about women, Morris, I must say, he commented. You could give a woman pointers by the dozen about a man, Morris, and swear to him with six affidavits yet. And what good would it do? It's like putting a wet paint sign up. Everybody feels the paint to see if it really would be wet. What for a looking woman is she, Abe? Morris asked, with an obvious effort at nonchalance. How should I know? Abe said. I only seen her a couple of times, and anyhow, Morris, I don't take it so particular to look at women like Leon Samet does, Morris. That fellow's a regular Don Quick's toe, Morris. He, he's all the time running around with women. A fellow gotta entertain buyers once in a while, Abe, Morris said. Buyers is all right, Morris, Abe declared. But I guess I've been in this here business long enough that I could tell a buyer from a model. That's all right, Abe, Morris said. Leon Samet may run around the streets with women, Abe, but that ain't saying he's got intentions to marry Mrs. Gladstein. A fella like Leon Samet, which he's crowding fifty pretty close, Abe, ain't looking to marry no widders. Young girls is all them fellas is looking out for, Abe. And anyhow, Abe, what for a match is Mrs. Gladstein to a manufacturer? She expects that she should get another husband, Abe. The only hope for her is some retailer would marry her as a going concern. She couldn't liquidate her business and come out even, let alone with money enough to get married, Abe. She don't gotta got money to get married on, Morris, Abe rejoined. 
anyone would be glad to marry such a woman supposing she didn't got a cent to her name she's an elegant looking woman morris not too thin not too fat morris and what a face she got it morris my rosie was a good-looking woman morris and is to-day yet but mrs gladstein morris that's a woman which is the theatre already you don't see such a looking woman she could dress herself too i bet you last time i was in bridgetown she's wearing one of our style four o two two which sam mcgandred from us and calls the lily langtree costume morris in a navy shade understand me and i don't know nothing about this here lily langtree morris but i could tell you right now morris she ain't got nothing on mrs gladstein when it comes to looks Morris nodded, and turned to the contemplation of some cutting slips while Abe made ready for lunch. "'Say, looky here, Abe,' Morris said, when Abe appeared with his hat on. "'I've been thinking about this here, Mrs. Gladstein, understand me? And I come to the conclusion. Why should we give up so easy? Gladstein always done a good business in that story, you understand? And if the wit is such a good-looking woman like you say she is, Abe, there's an opening for her to attract a big trade in gents' furnishings and hats up there, and at the same time keep the cloak and suit end going. What do you mean attract a big trade in gents' furnishings and hats, Morris? Abe demanded indignantly. If you think the woman's a flirt, Morris, you're making a big mistake. Must a woman got to be a flirt that she should sell gents' furnishings, Abe? Morris asked with some heat. That's all right, Morris. Abe said with a scowl. A lady ain't looking to sell the gents' furnishing trade, Morris. I know she ain't, Morris replied. But if a woman is good-looking, Abe, naturally she attracts the clothing and furnishing customers. But she don't got to sell those customers, Abe. Her husband can do that. Her husband can do that, Abe repeated. What are you talking about, her husband? Sure, her husband, Morris went on. And especially if a good-looking woman like Mrs. Gladstein were got for a husband, a good-looking man like B. Guerin, understand me? The idea works both ways. Mrs. Gladstein attracts the clothing trade, and B. Guerin sells them, you understand? While B. Guerin attracts the women's garments trade, and Mrs. Gladstein sells them. Abe sat down suddenly and took off his hat. What are you trying to drive into, Morris? he asked. I'm trying to drive into this, Abe, Morris replied. B. Guerin is a good-looking, up-to-date fella, but he's in wrong with that store of his in Mount Vernon. In the first place, the neighborhood ain't right, you understand? And in the second place, Guerin don't attend to business like he should, because he ain't married, and he ain't got no responsibilities. To such a fella, Abe, when it comes to taking a young lady on theater Saturday night, business is nix, even when Saturday's a big night in Mount Vernon. Abe nodded. Furthermore, Abe, Morris continued, if we go on selling B. Guerin, Abe, sooner or later he'd bust up on us, understand me? And we're not only out a customer, but the least he sticks us is a couple of hundred dollars. He owes us two hundred and fifty right now, Abe, since the first of the month already, ain't it? Abe nodded again. But you take a young fellow like B. Guerin, Abe, Morris went on, which all he needs is a wife to steady him, and an up-to-date Medina like Bridgetown to run a store in, but understand me, if we could put this thing through, Abe, not only are we doing a mitzvah for all concerned, Abe, but we're making a customer for life. You mean, Morris, Abe said slowly, you would try to make up a match between B. Guerin and Mrs. Gladstein? Sure, why not, Morris said. It stands in the Gamara, Abe. We are commanded to promote marriages, visit the sick, and bury the dead. Once more, Abe nodded, and this time he managed to impart the quality of irony to the gesture. Burying the dead is all right, Morris, he said. From a dead man you don't get no comebacks, and his relations is anyhow grateful. Ah, uh, but if you'd make up a match between a couple of people like Mrs. Gladstein and B. Guerin, what is it? Even if the marriage will be a success, Morris, then the couple claims they was just suited to each other, Morris. We don't get no credit for it anyway. On the other hand, Morris, if they don't agree together, they wouldn't hate each other near so much as they hate us. Why should they hate us? Morris asked. Our intentions is anyhow good. Sure, I know, Morris, Abe retorted. From having good intentions already, many a decent, respectable fella goes broke. 
Morris flapped the air impatiently with his right hand. Anybody could sit down and talk proverbs, Abe, he said. I guess I could talk proverbs in my own store, Morris, if I wanna, Abe rejoined with dignity. Sure you could, Morris replied. But one thing you gotta remember, Abe, while the back number's saying look out before you jump, the up-to-date fella has jumped already and lands on a $5,000 order with both feet already. I'll tell you, Mr. Perlmutter, it's like this, B. Guerin explained, as he sat in his Mount Vernon store that evening. Money don't figure at all with me. Where is the harm supposing she does got a little money, Guerin? Morris protested. And anyhow, never mind the money, Guerin. We will say for the sake of example, she ain't got no money. Does it do any harm to look at the woman? B. Guerin passed his hand through his wavy brown hair, cut semi-pompadour in the latest fashion. There was no denying B. Guerin's claims to beauty. What's the use talking, Mr. Perlmutter? He said, carefully examining his fingernails. I'm sick and tired of looking at him. Believe me, I ain't lying to you. If I looked at one, I must have looked at hundreds. The father's was rated at the very least D to F, first credit. And what is it? To most of them I wouldn't marry, not even the rating was A A one even. Such faces they got it, understand me? And the others, which has got the looks, you understand? You could take it from me, Mr. Perlmutter, they couldn't even cook a potato even. Girls which they got D to F fathers don't got to cook potatoes, Morris commented shortly. B. Guerin shrugged. For that matter, Mr. Perlmutter, he said, I don't take it so particular about my food neither. Say, looky here, Guerin, Morris exclaimed. What's the trouble with you anyhow? First you're telling me you don't care about money. Next you're kicking that the good-looking ones couldn't cook, you understand? And then you say you ain't so particular about cooking anyway. What for a kind of girl do you want, Guerin? Guerin continued to examine his fingernails and made no reply. Because, Guerin, Morris concluded, if you're looking for a homely girl, but she ain't got no money and couldn't cook, understand me? I wouldn't fool away my time with you at all. Such girls you don't need me to find for you. B. Guerin sighed profoundly. You shouldn't get mad, Mr. Perlmutter, he said, if I tell you something. Why should I get mad, Guerin? Morris asked. I'm coming all the way up here, which I'm leaving my wife and boy at home to do so. And maybe you don't think she put up a hollow Guerin. So if you wouldn't even consent to do me the favor and look at Mrs. Gladstein, Guerin, and I don't get mad, understand me, why should I get mad if you would tell me something? Well, Guerin commenced, it ain't much to tell, Mr. Perlmutter. I guess you hear already why I'm coming to this country. Morris elevated his eyebrows. I suppose you're coming here like anybody else comes here, he said. Sooner as stay in the old country and be a schnorrer all your life, you come here, ain't it? No, siree, sir, Guerin replied emphatically. If I would stay in the old country, Mr. Perlmutter, I don't got to be a schnorrer. Do you know Louis Moses, the banker in Minsk? Morris nodded. That's for me and uncle, which they do, Guerin said. And Zach's the big corn merchant, that's also an uncle. My father ain't a schnorrer neither, Mr. Perlmutter. In fact, instead, I am sending home money to Rushland. Like most fellows which they come to this country, Mr. Perlmutter, my people sends me money yet. He jumped from his chair and went to the safe, from which he extracted two crisp Russian banknotes. A hundred rubles apiece, he said, and his face beamed with pride. So, you see, I don't got to leave Rushland because I'd be a schnorrer over there. No. Morris replied. Then why did you leave, Guerin? So far what I could see, you ain't made it such a big success over here. You couldn't make me mad by saying that, Mr. Perlmutter, Guerin commented. A big success, so to a big failure, it makes no difference to me. It makes a whole lot difference to me, Morris cried. Yes, Mr. Perlmutter, B. Guerin went on, disregarding the interruption. I ain't coming over here to make a big success in business. I'm coming over here to forget. To forget? Morris exclaimed. What do you mean, forget? B. Guerin ran his hands once more through his pompadour and nodded slowly. That's what I said, he repeated. To forget. 
well i hope you ain't forgetting you owe us now two hundred and fifty dollars since the first of the month yet morris commented in dry matter-of-fact tones b Geeran waved his hand airily i can forget that easy mr perlmutter he said and morris winced but the rest i couldn't forget at all day and night i see her face mr perlmutter and such a face here he paused impressively nah he exclaimed and kissed the tip of his fingers while morris glanced uneasily toward the door her name is miss polanya and her father keeps a big flour mill on coralie chavitzi mr perlmutter Girin went on a fine family understand me and i'm going out there from minsk twice a week when a young fellow by the name lutsky a corn broker yet you understand comes to sell her father's goods again b Girin paused his left hand extended palm upward in a tremulous gesture suddenly it dropped on his knee with a despondent smack in two weeks already they was married he concluded and me i'm coming to america you ain't coming to such a bad place neither morris rejoined even supposing your uncles was such big machers in the old country places is all the same to me now girin said women too mr perlmutter i assure you mr perlmutter since the day i'm leaving minsk one woman is the same as another to me ain't got no use for none of em give fair girin morris cried impatiently you talk like a fool just because one lady goes back on you understand me is that a reason you wouldn't got no use for no ladies at all you might just as well say girin because one customer busts up on you you understand you'd never try to sell another customer so long as you live now this here miss gladstein girin is a lady which while well, i never seen this here lady in whistlin you understand if you will just come out to bridgetown with me girin i give you a guarantee whistlin wouldn't figure at all Girin shook his head sadly. "'You don't know me, Mr. Perlmutter,' he said. "'Well, I'm going with plenty shotchins to see young ladies already, Mr. Perlmutter. I assure you my heart ain't in it. People get the impression because I'm a swell dresser, Mr. Perlmutter, that I'm looking to get married. But believe me, Mr. Perlmutter, it ain't so.' "'Then what do you go for, Girin?' Morris asked. "'Shatchins don't like to fool away their time no more as I do, Girin.' And you could take it from me, no girl is going to the trouble to fix herself up and make a nice supper for you and the shatchkin simply for the pleasure of seeing a swell dresser, Girin. That's just the point, Mr. Perlmutter, Girin said. A fellow which runs a store like this one and eats his meals in restaurants, understand me, must got to get a little home cooking once in a while, ain't it? Why not get married and be done with it? Morris retorted. And then you can get home cooking all the time once more girin shook his head without love mr perlmutter marriage is nix he said schmooze morris exclaimed do you think i got married i loved my wife girin oh so a shtuck and today yet i'm crazy about her with a business man girin love comes after marriage b girin rose wearily to his feet and shot his cuffs by way of showing impatience what's the use talking mr perlmutter he protested when i want to get married i would get married otherwise not he flecked away an imaginary grain of dust from the lapel of his coat and walked slowly toward the door are you going home on the new haven road or to the harlem road he asked morris scowled and his indignation lent such force to the gesture with which he put on his hat that the impact sounded like a blow on a tambourine sean good girin he said i'm through with you he paused at the doorway and lit a cigar and one thing i can tell you girin he concluded either you would send us a check the first thing tomorrow morning or we would give you your account to our lawyers and that's all there is to it he puffed away at his cigar and he trudged down the street and he had nearly reached the corner when he heard a familiar voice shouting mr perlmutter he turned to view b girin hastening after him well, Girin, he grunted, what do you want now? Girin stopped and gasped for breath, and Morris's heart gave a triumphant leap as he noted the anxiety displayed on B. Girin's clean shaven features. Speak up, Girin, he said. I gotta get to my train. 
Girin smiled in surrender. All right, Mr. Perlmutter, he murmured. Make for me a date and I'll look the lady over. End of section 15《Section 16 of Abe and Morris》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Section 16. Chapter 11. Man Proposes. Part 2. When Morris entered his place of business the next morning, he found his partner examining the advertising columns of a morning paper, with an absorption hardly justified by the tabulated list of births, marriages, and deaths at which he was gazing. "'What's biting you now, Abe?' Morris demanded. "'What do you mean, what's biting me?' Abe rejoined and Morris blushed in the consciousness of his oversleeping that morning by more than half an hour. "'Say, looky here, Abe,' he cried. "'I don't know what you're driving into, understand me? But if you think you could get brogus at me just because I'm ten minutes late once in a while, you understand? Let me tell you, I'm catching a twelve o'clock train from Mount Vernon last night, and not alone. I'm talking myself blue in the face to that fellow Girin, you understand?' But when I got home already, I couldn't get to sleep till I told the whole thing to my Minnie yet. Abe nodded slowly. Yes, Abe, Morris continued. I gotta go over the story twice over already. And even then, you understand, my Minnie gets mad because I didn't contradict myself. Only one idea that woman got in her head, Abe. If I'm out of the house shown ten minutes already, you couldn't tell her otherwise, but I'm playing auction pinochle. "'Well, you might just as well have been playing auction pinochle last night for all the good it would do us.' "'What are you talking about, all the good it would do us?' Morris almost whimpered. "'I actually got the fella dead to rights, Abe, and all I must now do is to work from the other end.' Abe burst into a mirthless laugh and handed Morris the paper. "'You should have worked the other end first, Morris,' he declared, as he indicated an advertising item with his thumb. That's what Leon Samet did, Morris. Morris seized the paper, and his face grew purple as he read the following notice. Engaged. Asimov, Gladstein. Mrs. Sonia Gladstein of Bridgetown, PA, to Jacob Asimov of Dottyville, PA, at home Sunday, next three to seven at the residence of Miss Leah Samet, 86 and three and a quarter, West 118th Street. No cards. Leon's mother makes the engagement party for him, Morris, Abe said dryly. Cost a whole lot of money, too, and I bet you Mrs. Glastine wouldn't notice it at all in the next six months' statements Leon sends to her. Morris stifled a groan as he laid down the paper and forced himself to smile confidently. What difference does an engagement make, Abe? he asked. An engagement ain't a wedding, Abe, and it ain't too late even now. Again, Abe indulged in a bitter laugh. "'You're a regular optician, Morris,' he said. "'You never give up hope.' "'That's all right, Abe,' Morris retorted. "'We could stand a couple of opticians in this concern. "'Always you're ready to lay down a proposition "'just as soon as things goes a little wrong, understand me? "'But me, I think differently.' "'Abe shrugged and rose to his feet. "'Well, Morris,' he said, Take off your hat and coat and stay a while. Maybe you could do a little business here this morning for a change. Maybe we could. Maybe we couldn't, Abe, Morris rejoined, as he buttoned up his coat. But just the same, I'm going to do something which you will really be surprised. Not at all, Abe corrected. We are partners together so long, I'm only surprised supposing you should act sensible. Well, the way I look at it, I am acting sensible, Abe. Morris announced. I am acting sensible because I'm going right down to see Marcus Flax, and I would buy from him for ten dollars cut glass, and I would show that sucker Samet he couldn't phase me none. What do you mean, couldn't phase you none? Abe asked. I mean, if Samet is such a faker, he goes to work and makes engagement parties for his customers, 
and puts em on the paper yet abe morris declared as he jammed his hat down more firmly on his head he must gotta expect his competitors would take advantage of it understand me and you could bet your sweet life abe sunday afternoon comes three o'clock i'm right there at his mother's house with the cut glass and don't you forget it abe nodded grimly it's a free country morris he said and nobody can stop you going to an engagement party which is in the paper you understand but you shouldn't forget one thing morris you got on our ledger a drawing account for stays too and on your way out you should please tell miss cohn to enter the ten dollars cut glass in the right place don't worry abe morris cried as he started for the elevator when the time comes we should post in the ledger if we ain't opened a new account in bridgetown pa i'd pay for it myself ten minutes later he entered the twenty-third street subway station en route to canal street and no sooner had he bought his ticket than his enthusiasm began to wane after all he reflected as he boarded the train ten dollars worth of cut glass seemed rather extravagant when one considered the size of an order that in the most favorable circumstances might emanate from a store in bridgetown indeed as the train pulled into the eighteenth street station he had come to believe that seven dollars and fifty cents would be a generous price and even this figure commenced to look huge as fourteenth street drew near at astor place morris decided that five dollars worth of cut glass would be more appropriate for a widow when the guard announced the next stop as bleecker street however it occurred to morris that the manufacturers of quadruple plate were producing some very artistic effects in knives forks and spoons which in appearance were undistinguishable from sterling silver and the train was leaving spring street when morris bethought himself of a certain bonbonniere that had cost mrs perlmutter precisely four dollars at a dry goods store he distinctly recalled examining the trademark to which were affixed the words triple plate during the short walk from the canal street station to marcus flack's place of business he wondered vaguely if there was such a thing as a double plate and when at last he opened the door of the pawnbroker's sales store in question he approached the counter with his mind fully made up do you got maybe some sets from nut picks he inquired of the proprietor marcus flax took the question in ill part what the devil do you think i'm running here he demanded by way of an answer a five and ten cent store since when do they sell it nut picks in a five and ten cent store morris retorted flax snorted angrily i don't think they sell em even in five and ten cent stores he said and anyhow mr perlmutter what for a present is nut picks if a fella eats nuts twice a year that's a big average for my part it would also break my heart if i'd never eat another nut so long as i live now what you want to get is something cheap ain't it morris nodded something about two dollars and fifty cents he said that's what i thought flax replied and for two dollars and fifty cents there ain't much choice olive dishes is all i could show you let me give it a look at em morris said and as flax led the way to the well-stocked shelves in the rear of the store morris discerned for the first time the presence of another customer how much did you say that there coffee samovar was cried a familiar voice i told you before mr klinger flax said that ain't no samovar that's a percolator and it cost me so sure as i'm standing here fifteen dollars so i would let you have it for twelve fifty on account it's being shop-worn take ten dollars and make an end rejoined klinger tendering a bill for ten dollars i can give you a fine piece cut glass mr klinger flax insisted by way of answer klinger tucked away the ten dollar bill he had taken from his waistcoat pocket and flax seized the coffee percolator with both hands i'll wrap it up for you right away he said and then it was that klinger recognized morris who had been standing unnoticed in the background hello perlmutter he said what are you doing here 
"'I guess I'm doing the same thing what you're doing, Klinger,' Morris replied stiffly. "'I'm buying for a customer a present, ain't it?' Klinger nodded. "'Honestly, Perlmutter,' he said. "'I never seen the like how things happen. "'No sooner you start to sell goods to a fellow "'than somebody's engaged or married in his family. "'He must be a pretty good customer the way you're blowing yourself.' Morris commented. I bet you, Klinger said as he walked away. And if you be in our place, you do the same. For five minutes, Morris examined the cut glass, and when Flax returned, he had decided upon an olive dish of most intricate design. That's a close buyer, that Mr. Klinger, Flax observed. Not near so close as I am, Morris declared. "'Well, you wouldn't anyhow kick on paying twenty-five cents express, Mr. Perlmutter,' Flax said. "'But that feller actually wants me to deliver the package for nothing.' "'Why not?' Morris asked. "'Don't everybody deliver packages free?' "'Not a pawnbroker's sales store,' Flax replied. "'And anyhow, Mr. Perlmutter, Leon Samet this morning buys from me for thirty dollars silver to be sent to the same place on 118th Street. Is that their percolator?' And he didn't kick only a little that I'm charging him fifty cents express. What? Morris exclaimed. Is Klinger sending that percolator up to 118th Street, too? That's what I said, Flax answered. And Morris replaced the cut glass dish on the shelf. Was the name Gladstein? He inquired, and Flax nodded. Then in that case, Morris said savagely, let me look at some sterling silver for about twenty-five dollars. If them suckers could stand it, so could I. More than two days had elapsed before Abe had exhausted the topic of Mrs. Gladstein's ten-dollar engagement present. He discussed it satirically, profanely, and earnestly from the standpoint of business ethics in such maddening reiterations that Morris could not help wondering how much longer Abe's criticism would have continued, had he known that the cold meat tray really cost twenty-five dollars. "'You're throwing away good money after bad, Morris,' Abe said, renewing the subject after an interval of comparative calm. "'Because so sure as you are standing there, we would never get our two hundred and fifty out of that fella Girin.' "'What has Mrs. Gladstein's present got to do with Guerin?' Morris asked. "'If I told you once, Abe, in the last two days I'm telling you a dozen times, understand me? I am giving that there cold meat tray to Mrs. Gladstein as a speculation, Abe. What difference does it make who she marries, Abe, Guerin, or to Asimov, so long as we would land from her an order for five hundred dollars?' "'Yeah, you would land from her an order for five hundred dollars.' Abe exclaimed. "'Well, if Saul Klinger could do it, why couldn't we?' Morris asked. "'What are you talking about, Saul Klinger?' Abe demanded. Thereupon Morris related to Abe the circumstances surrounding Saul Klinger's purchase of the coffee percolator, and, when he concluded, Abe nodded slowly. "'So that highwayman is butting in, too?' he commented. "'How much should you say he's paying for that samovar, Morris?' Morris closed his eyes as though he were making a conscientious effort to remember the exact amount. Thirty dollars, he announced at last. What? Abe cried. You stood there and let Saul Klinger buy for thirty dollars a present where we ourselves only spend ten? What for a piker are you anyway, Morris? What do you mean, what for a piker am I? Morris said indignantly. You're talking me black in the face on account I'm spending ten dollars, and now you're kicking it I didn't spend thirty? Did you tell me before that's all Klinger buys a present? Abe asked. And furthermore, Morris, this wouldn't be the first time we're spending money to get business. Couldn't we afford to lay out thirty dollars if we want to? But Abe, Morris began, but nothing, Abe roared. Why should you get all of a sudden so sparse and mid our money, Morris? You talk like we would be new beginners on East Broadway already. But Abe, Morris protested again. It's enough, Morris, Abe interrupted. I heard enough from you already. Only one thing I got to tell you. If we lose a chance of getting some business from a lady, which you could really say I know her well enough that it's a shame we ain't sold her nothing already even. Don't blame me. That's all I got to say. 
he walked away to the cutting room while morris sat down in the nearest chair dazed to the point of temporary aphasia for five minutes he sat still endeavoring to trace the intricacies of a discussion that had put him so decisively in the wrong and he was still pondering the matter when the elevator door opened and b Guerin alighted how do you do mr perlmutter Guerin cried morris grunted inarticulately and made no attempt to take his visitor's proffered hand did you got any news for me Guerin asked morris rose to his feet yes i got some good news for you he said i got news for you that mrs gladstein is engaged to be married to a fellow by the name asimov he looked absently at a sample rack upon which reposed the very newspaper that contained the advertisement here it is he continued as he seized the paper you could see for yourself he handed the advertisement to Guerin, who read it over unmoved well i must tell you the honest truth mr perlmutter he said i couldn't say as i'm sorry and he smiled amiably as morris gazed at the fashion plate features and the fashion plate apparel of his visitor he entirely forgot his optimistic scheme of supplanting asimov with Guerin, and he grew suddenly livid with a fierce rage you ain't ain't you he bellowed well you ought to be because so sure as you're standing there comes monday morning and we don't get a check from you we would close you up for sure you understand now looky here mr perlmutter Guerin began but the reaction set up by morris's encounter with his partner had begun to have its effect and he seized Guerin by one padded shoulder out he roared out of my place you rotten cheap dude you and two minutes later b Guerin fled wildly down the stairs the newspaper still clutched in his hand although leon sammet had at first been actuated by motives of a somewhat sordid nature in his negotiation of mrs gladstein's betrothal his subsequent behavior was tempered by the traditional hospitality of his race as for his mother mrs elias sammet she entered upon the preparations for the reception with an ardor that could not have been exceeded had mrs gladstein been her own daughter thus when sunday afternoon arrived mrs sammet's house on one hundred and eighteenth street presented an appearance of unusual festivity the long narrow parlor had been liberally draped with smilax and sparingly decorated with ex table de haute roses until it resembled the mortuary chapel of a mulberry street undertaker and this effect was if anything heightened by four dozen camp chairs that had been procured from the sexton of mrs sammet's place of worship a fine odor of cooking ascended from the basement kitchen and when jacob asimov had entered the front door at the behest of a colored man with white gloves he sniffed the fragrant atmosphere of the lobby like a coon dog at the base of a hollow tree am i the first here he asked barney sammet the junior partner of sammet brothers who had been detailed by his elder brother to receive the arriving guests with strict injunction to keep an eye on the cigars barney nodded gloomily and ain't mrs gladstein i mean sonya come yet jacob inquired we just now got a telephone from her the train from bridgetown is late and she'll be here in half an hour barney replied that's a fine lookout asimov commented i bet you by that time you get a big crowd here the words were prophetic for the shuffling of many feet on the front stoop preluded the arrival of saul clinger mrs clinger mo klein and mrs klein who were immediately succeeded by the firm of Kleiman and ellenbogen a trashkin the coat pad manufacturer and mark spazinski it must be conceded that leon sammet comported himself in a highly creditable manner and he greeted his guests with cordiality that embraced competitor and customer in one impartial comprehensive smile why how do you do mr clinger he exclaimed and then he turned to mrs leah sammet who stood beside him mamma he said i want you to know mr clinger him and me has been competitors for twenty years already mrs sammet nodded and smiled for my part twenty years longer 
she murmured as she grasped Saul's hand. At a time like this, Mrs. Samet, Saul rejoined, it don't make no difference to me if a man is ever so much a competitor. What I claim is let a sleeping dog alone. Mrs. Samet endorsed the sentiment with another smile, and Saul with his retinue passed on into the back parlor for the purpose of inspecting the presents. In the meantime, other guests had preceded them, and among them was a man whose bearing and raiment proclaimed the creature of fashion. Not only were his trousers of the latest narrow design, but they were of sufficient modish brevity, half to conceal and half to reveal a pair of gossamer silk socks, which, in their turn, were encased by patent leather low-cut shoes. The latter exhibited the square knobbiness that only fashion artists can impart to the footgear of their models, while the broad laces that held them by the insecure holds of two eyelets were knotted in a bow that might have been appended to the collar of Mr. Paderewski himself. "'Ain't this Mr. Gearin?' Saul Klinger asked. The creature of fashion nodded. "'You're a friend of the collo, ain't it?' Klinger commented, employing the vernacular equivalent for the English word bride. "'In a way,' Gearin said evasively. "'Aber the cosin, I don't know at all.' Thus did Girin imply that he was not acquainted with the future bridegroom, and Klinger volunteered the information that Asimov ran a dry goods store in Dottyville, Pennsylvania. I sold him goods for years, he added, and I guess I would continue to do so, even if that gun of Samet would make twenty engagement parties for him. Did you see the samovar I gave him? He pointed proudly to a silver-plated object, and Girin glanced at it scornfully. Potash and Perlmutter gives him solid silver, he commented. A wide dish. Sure, I know, Klinger said. Thin like paper. Abba Sterling, Gearin insisted. And Klinger made a telling diversion. I suppose you sent him something sterling also, he said. Me? Gearin exclaimed. Why should I buy presents? I'm a retailer myself, Mr. Klinger, so I sent him some flowers. I don't see him nowhere, Saul retorted. They're over there, B. Gearin said, making a sweeping gesture in the general direction of the mantelpiece. And as he did so, a bass voice sounded at his elbow. Put my eye out, why don't you? cried Abe Potash, and then he recognized his assailant. Say, what are you doing here? he demanded. B. Gearin looked coldly at his creditor and shrugged his shoulders. I got just as much of right to be here as you he said, and that partner of yours, too. He hurled this defiance at Morris, who had entered the room on Abe's heels, but the retort passed unnoticed so far as Morris was concerned, since he was absorbed in the contemplation of the presence. Well, Klinger, he said, you're making Mrs. Gladstein a pretty fine present, ain't it? Klinger scowled. Mrs. Gladstein, I ain't bothering my head about at all, he replied. But when a cutthroat like Samet makes out a scheme to steal away from me an old customer like Asimov, I gotta protect myself. Morris whistled expressively. So you're making the present to Asimov? He commented. Sure I am, Saul answered. As for Mrs. Gladstein, she got presents enough from me. The first time she was married, I'm sending some money to the old country to my father. He should make her a present on account Mrs. Gladstein's father is my father's a third cousin, understand? And when she marries Gladstein, you understand I gave her both an engagement and a wedding present both. And do you think that sucker, Olaf Hasholom, ever buys for me a dollar's worth of goods? Also a shtuk. And you say Mrs. Gladstein was twice it married? Morris asked. Ain't I just telling you so? Saul replied. "'What was her first husband's name?' Morris asked. But the question remained unanswered, for at that very moment a confusion of noises in the front parlor signaled the arrival of the bride. Morris and Saul followed the other guests from the rear parlor, and then it was that Morris discerned his partner's appreciative description of Mrs. Gladstein's claim to be in no way exaggerated. She was arrayed in a black silk dress of a design well calculated to display her graceful figure, while her oval face was shaded by a black picture hat, beneath which her large dark eyes glowed and flashed by turns. 
moreover her complexion was all cream and roses and when she smiled two rows of even white teeth were exposed between a pair of tantalizing red lips morris commenced to perspire with embarrassment as he remembered how he had planned to negotiate a match for this glorious creature a task that only a very prince of marriage brokers might have essayed he turned away but as his eye rested on b Gearin, who still lingered over the presence he was obliged to admit that he had chosen a fitting candidate and he even felt mollified toward his delinquent customer as he reflected on Gurin's lost opportunity. Gurin, he said, ain't you going to congratulate the Kahlo? I didn't know she was here at all, Gurin said sadly. The truth was that Gurin's presence at the reception that afternoon was not inspired by curiosity concerning either Mrs. Gladstein or Asimov. Business was undeniably bad with him, and he was making an earnest effort to keep his financial head above water. Thus, he limited his personal expenses to the preservation of his wardrobe, and he had cut down his cost of living to a degree that permitted only a very low lunch-wagon diet. He saw in Mrs. Samet's hospitality the prospect of a meal, and although he was by no means courageous, his appetite spurred him on to brave his creditor's wrath. "'I'll take a look at her,' he murmured apologetically, and he began to elbow his way through the group that surrounded the engaged couple. Morris patted him on the shoulder as he passed, and was about to return to the back parlor when a shriek came from the center of the congratulatory throng. "'Boris!' cried a female voice with a note of hysteria in its shrill tones. "Sonya." B. Guerin exclaimed, and the next moment he clasped Mrs. Gladstein in his arms. "'You was asking me the name of Mrs. Gladstein's first husband,' said Saul Klinger to Morris Perlmutter as they descended the stoop together half an hour later. "'It was Aaron Lutsky. He died two years after they was married. I knew his family well in the old country.' Hers too, Perlmutter. Her father was a fellow by the name of Polanya, and today yet he runs a big flour mill on Koroleskovitsi. So I understand, Morris said. But what's that you got there under your coat? He referred to a huge bulge on the right side of Saul Klinger's Prince Albert coat, which Saul was supporting with both hands. That's my present, Saul said, as if surprised at the question. And if Marcus Flax wouldn't give me my money back, understand me, I could anyhow exchange it for something useful. It don't make no difference, Morris, Abe said, as they sat in the showroom two months later. The fella should gotta pay us that two hundred and fifty dollars. But we would get lots of business out of them now that they are married, Abe, Morris protested. Sure, I know, Morris, and they got lots of presents out of us too, Morris, Abe said. Counting the engagement and the wedding present, Morris, and my Rosie's new dress, and the pants which you bought it to go with your tuxedo, understand me? First and last, we must be out a hundred and fifty dollars. Morris nodded. He recognized that an opportunity was here presented to correct Abe's figures by the addition of fifteen dollars to the price of the engagement present, but he deemed it more prudent to await the arrival of Girin's first order. In point of fact, Morris had begun to examine the mails with some anxiety for a letter postmarked Bridgetown. More than two weeks had elapsed since Guerin's wedding, and making due allowances for honeymooning, it seemed to Morris that from an inspection of Mrs. Gladstein's stock made by him on a congratulatory visit to Bridgetown, there was immediate need for replenishment. "'I don't understand why we don't hear from them people at all,' he said." "'Give him a show, Morris. Give him a show,' Abe replied. "'A man only gets married for the first time once.' Morris shrugged. "'For my part, Abe, I ain't in no hurry,' he said. "'If you could see the way Leon Samick gives me a look this morning "'when I see him on the subway, you understand it'd be worth to you a hundred and fifty dollars.' "'Saul Klinger is feeling sore, too, Abe. 
I seen him in Hammersmith's yesterday, and he says to me, Flax wouldn't exchange that samovar arrangement which he bought it, so he took it home with him, and he ain't drunk nothing but coffee in two months. I bet you, Abe commented, and he also ain't got an order from Asimov in two months. The fellow's heartbroken, Morris. He even had made arrangements to sell the store in Dottyville and move over to Bridgetown, you understand? And when he called the deal off, the purchaser sues him for breach of contract yet. But why should he get mad at Klinger? Morris asked. Klinger didn't do him nothing. Maybe you don't think so, Morris, but Asimov figures differently, because he told me this morning that after the engagement is off, understand me, Mrs. Gladstein and him makes a division of the presents. Asimov takes what was sent by the concerns which are selling him goods, and Mrs. Gladstein takes the rest, all excepting a present they got from Mark Spisinski. Spisinski used to sell him both goods, understand? But fortunately, Morris, he sends him a dozen coffee spoons, so Asimov takes six and Mrs. Gladstein takes six. It's a good thing Pazinski didn't send him a single piece of cut glass, Morris said thoughtfully. It wouldn't make no difference to Asimov, Abe said. He would have allowed Mrs. Gladstein half cost price, give or take. He's a pretty square fellow, Asimov is, Morris, and he said he would give a look in here this afternoon. We needn't be afraid from him, Morris. He's A number one up to two hundred and fifty dollars, thirty days net. Morris nodded again and walked slowly toward the cutting room, while his partner sat down to read the trade news in the daily cloak and suit record. Morris had hardly reached the doorway, however, when a strident shout caused him to retrace his steps in a hurry. "'What's the matter now?' he exclaimed, but Abe was incapable of articulate speech. Instead, he held out the paper and made noises appropriate to an apoplectic seizure, which Morris construed as a request to look at something of more than ordinary interest. "'Where? Where?' he demanded, and Abe stuck a trembling forefinger through the printed page, as nearly as the torn edges of the paper would permit, Morris read the following paragraph. Bridgetown, Pennsylvania. D. Gladstein's store closed. The stock and fixtures of the general store conducted here by D. Gladstein deceased were closed out last week, and his widow, who recently married B. Guerin, sailed from New York with her husband yesterday for Hamburg. It is understood that they intend to reside permanently in Europe. While Morris perused the item, Abe gradually recovered his composure, and when his partner at last put down the paper, Abe was able to smile the slow, ghostly smile of a man who has called four deuces with an ace full. Well, Morris, he said resignedly, a fellow must expect the worst when he's got an optician for a partner. End of section 16. End of Abe and Morris. Being further adventures of Potash and Pearl Mutter by Montague Glass.